Now we're going to look at Joshua through Ruth. This is the beginning of the historical portion of the Old Testament, uh, usually known as the writings or the history. Um, and that area actually goes from Joshua all the way through Esther. Now we're going to eventually get all the way through Esther, but we're going to begin in the first three books of the of, of that historical portion, and that is uh, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. Uh, now, I, I went through Deuteronomy, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, rather quickly. If you take this survey course, uh, maybe later on in a seminary, or uh, even if you were to take it somewhere else, a great deal of emphasis is placed on the first five books of the Bible. I placed less emphasis for you and for the portion of the purpose of this class because generally a lot of people already know about the first five books of the Bible. Or if they're reading the first five books of the Bible, get bogged down in Leviticus and Numbers and never really finish through Deuteronomy and get to probably my favorite portion of the Old Testament, and that is the historical narrative portion of the Old Testament. So I'm talking about Joshua through Esther, although there is historic narrative throughout the Old Testament, but this is where the large portion of it is. So I'm going to look at first Joshua and now you see a transition of leadership for the people of Israel from Moses to Joshua. Remember, Moses is not going to enter into the promised land. He's going to stand on the mountain above it, see it with his eyes, but uh, he will die before they enter in because God has purposed this because Moses did not listen to God. And there is an entire generation of people who will not enter into the promised land. There's only two people who will, and that is Joshua and Caleb. They were the two spies, remember, that went into uh, the land. And all the other spies came back and they saw well, there's giants in the land. We're you know, not going to make it. We're not going to survive. But Joshua and Caleb, they had a different report. Uh, although they said there are giants in the land, but they were convicted that God was with them, so they would be able to win the land. And that is what God ultimately uses and brings them to power and prominence in the nation. And they're going to be the ones, particularly Joshua, who leads the people in. So as far as the content of Joshua is concerned, the first part of Joshua narrates Israel's violent entry into the land. We're not going to make excuses for what took place. We're not going to try to sugarcoat what God told them to do. And God told them to go into the land and to destroy the enemy. And so they did. But when they did not listen to God, God punished them, right? And they lose the battle of Ai because of Achan's sin. And we'll talk about that. But Israel prepares a way, uh, prepares for war physically and spiritually by circumcising their men and observing the Passover. So before they go in, um, they go through these rituals and he's having to do with Old Testament um, covenants that were made. Remember the sign of the covenant God made with Abraham was circumcision and what a bad day that was uh, when all the guys realized what they were going to have to do, right? Um, so uh, they not only did that, but they observed the Passover. Of course, that took place. Uh, in the book of Exodus, that is when God told the children of Israel to 
slaughter a lamb, put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost so the deaf angel would pass over their house and they would be protected during that last portion of the plagues that befell Egypt. Uh, then you have Rahab, and Rahab is in, he, she invite invited in, into the camp of Israel. Remember, she assists the spies. She shows uh, showing the uh, indigenous population that had the option of joining with Israel. So uh, she made this choice. She uh, actually becomes an Israelite. She is a Gentile. Uh, she's living there in Jericho. She's a prostitute, as the Bible tells us. Uh, but it's it's amazing, and I'll make a connection later to the book of Ruth and how Rahab uh, plays even in the book of Ruth. But what can we learn about Rahab and how God views outsiders. God's plan even before uh, Acts, when uh, basically it's, okay, now we'll go to the Gentiles, but God all along was grafting in Gentiles, Rahab being one of them, and then Ruth another. But before they enter into the land, the priests reenacted the Exodus by parting the waters of the Jordan. So there was the parting of the waters before they went into Jericho as they crossed. And when Israel attacks Jericho, they are blessed with victory. However, when they attack Ai, they are met with defeat because God had instructed them to uh, totally destroy the people and to not take any riches do not take any wealth and Achan does and because of that uh, Achan and his family are executed we call it murder it was it was an execution okay Achan's plunder of the city of Jericho violated the principles of a holy war set forth by God and now all these, all the things from the battle of Jericho were to be set before God and not kept for personal wealth. Achan did that and God handled it. Uh, God reveals himself uh, to be a divine warrior uh, who works on behalf of Israel in their obedience and against Israel in their disobedience. So often objections are thrown up about the old testament about how god deals with people who are not his people but rarely do i hear an objection about how god deals with his own people because at times god deals with his own people just as harshly as he would something someone else so he he chastens his people as well okay uh, after joshua takes ai uh, Israel defeats both the southern and the northern coalitions in an open battlefield. So this, when you when you look at the book of Joshua, it's it's a war book. It, it's almost like uh, reading accounts of civil war battles that went on uh, years ago. Uh, the second part of the book of Joshua focuses in on the allotment of the land to the original tribe. So all those 12 tribes, they're getting their land and the land's being spread out and split out amongst them. Uh, the victory in the first half of the book is met with the reality of the incomplete conquest of the land. Do they totally wipe out all the people? No, no, they don't. They don't totally wipe them out. Um, in fact, that's, something that God continually brings up later on and all the prophets will call people back to and all the, uh, as it will be said in the text of scripture, the intermarriage going on between uh, Jew and Gentile and what that brings about. And that will be an issue uh, all throughout the Old Testament. 
uh, each tribe struggles to secure the tribal land allotment from the leftover indigenous people. Uh, and it just continues on. Uh, the last two chapters detail the Joshua's farewell and the renewal of the covenant like Moses. So uh, much like uh, what happened with Moses happens with Joshua. Joshua and that transition of his leadership, there was a, a reason God chose Joshua to lead these people. And you see that there. And then this seeming unity of the tribes in Joshua under his leadership unravels in the book of Judges. That is the case. Judges is the book in which you hear the echo continue on. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Um, and so that's what we'll look at when we look at the book of Judges. Uh, here's a little mock-up uh, picture of a recreation of the Ark of the Covenant. Of course, this is what was uh, was with the people of Israel when they walked over uh, the priests had it walked over the Jordan. The Jordan parted before they went into Jericho. And, of course, it's part of their religious ceremony. And the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies. And this is actually, of course, the thing, uh, the vessel that carries the tablets, the Ten Commandments of God. So that's what we have. When we look at um, the Ark of the Covenant, this is a rendering of what it is thought to look like. Uh, I don't know anybody that knows exactly what it looks like because nobody's seen it in over thousands of years. I do think it still uh, is somewhere, but we don't know where. Maybe God will reveal that one day. Authorship. Uh, when you deal, when you talk about authorship, you have to deal with some issues, some editorial notes, and some shaping are uh, discerned in uh, pointing to a later final book of Joshua. Uh, so they're looking at editorial notes, and it may be some things that were added later that only could come to light at a later time, a later date. Uh, and then the dates are for the conquests are connected to the Exodus event. And then the conquest uh, has both short, unified, and protected contentions and descriptions. Another thing, much like, um, much like Deuteronomy, uh, Joshua dies at the end. And so if, if Joshua wrote the book of Joshua, then how... Is he going to be able to write about his death? He's not. Okay. Uh, total rejection as historical by minimalist scholars. So some uh, will say well, this is not historical events. Um, laying cards on the table, I do think it is historical events. And so it is historical narrative. So when we talk about these as stories, it's not stories in the sense of you know, a fictionary tale. These are tellings of stories that actually took place. So this is historical event, and it's being told as narrative, so that's why we call it historical narrative. Uh, then we have uh, different models that are often spoken of when we speak of genre. We have an, an immigration model, a resolution model, and then uh, internal uh, transformation model. And these uh, play a, a role in uh, what the genre of um, the book of Joshua is. But it's historical narrative. If I were to ask you, uh, what is the genre of the book of Joshua? And you say narrative, that's, that's correct. It's a narrative. Now we go to the book of Judges. Uh, what is right in their own eyes? Because that seems to be the case. Because everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. So what is good to them 
is good to them. What is good to you is good to you. Everybody is living for themselves. Um, doesn't sound much different from contemporary times, does it? Uh, content. Uh, the book of Judges is characterized by a downward spiral. Uh, you have cycles in the book of Judges. The cycle is uh, basically that uh, God uh, would establish his people uh, and then the people would rebel against God, do things that would not, that God would not do. So what God does is raise up uh, a people against them, whether it be the Amorites, uh, Jebusites, uh, Amalekites, all those other ites, right? The Canaanites, and later on it would be the Philistines. But uh, they he would raise those up against them as judgment against them, then send a judge, the people would repent, and then the cycle would just start all over again. So... A downward spiral. It just keeps getting worse. You read the end of the book of Judges, and if some of those events don't make you weep, every time I read the end of the book of Judges, uh, I cry over what happened to the Levites' concubine. It, what God is doing is he's saying, this is how bad it was in Israel. This is how bad it can get, even among the people of God, if they turn their back on me. So, keep that in mind when you read the book of Judges. Uh, Israel's, Israel sins against God, it almost, at, at, more, at times it's worse than others, but yes, it's just always a continual cycle. God allows Israel to fall uh, to their enemies, then God calls out, uh, and the Israelites call out to God for deliverance. This is the cycle. God raises up a judge. The judge delivers Israel and brings peace to the land. The judge dies and is buried, and the cycle begins all over again. This is uh, seemingly how uh, the book of Judges goes. So you have authorship and date. Uh, Along with other historical books, Judges is anonymous. Um, that is one way of looking at the book of Judges. Um, so we don't know exactly who wrote the book. Uh, sometimes books are attributed to people, uh, but sometimes books are anonymous. Does it mean that uh, it's not uh, a God-ordained and part of the canon? It just means we just don't know who wrote it. The likely context is the transition from the late Bronze Age to the early Iron Age. They look at uh, hi the historical events, weaponry that is used, uh, and determine try to determine um, where this all falls. Uh, the, Isra the Israelite tribes began to fragment more and seek for a king to unify the tribes. Uh, that will be found in our discussion of First Samuel. Okay, when ultimately they yearn for a king in First Samuel eight, and all that comes along with it. Structure, as far as genre is concerned, there there is a structure. There is a prologue up front talking about the tribal settlement. Settlement. This is kind of a leftover from Joshua. Uh, this is why these books are put together the way they are. Uh, we have various judges, uh, Othnel being the first judge. Uh, you may need to note that Othnel is the first judge. Um, you have the epilogue uh, of the tribal conflict. Uh, that takes place on the end, tribes warring against each other. And uh, what happens with the tribe of Benjamin is uh, particularly interesting. Uh, the two appendices uh, narrate the spiral of decay of the tribes in the land and show how anyone coming from uh, Gibbeth 
or a Benjamin will be rejected, i.e. Saul, tribe of where? Okay. So briefly, we want to meet the judges. Uh, and there is select judges, uh, major and minor judges, uh, major judges, uh, meaning that more time is given to them. Uh, Deborah, Gideon, uh, Japhath, and Samson, and then the minor judges, judges uh, Samgar, Shamgar, uh, Tola, and Jar. King Abimelech is negatively portrayed in this section. Also, you have tribes that are reflected by the representative judges, i.e., or E I A G, uh, Samson coming from Dan. Uh, although there are 12 judges, each of the tribe is not mentioned, so they don't all have a judge representative. Then you have Gideon, Brock, Samson, and Japheth are all mentioned in Hebrews 11. Jephthah, golly. Um, Hebrews 11. See, Listen, Hebrew is tough, but Hebrew 11 is uh, New Testament, of course, uh, and it's the Great Hall of Faith, and you have these mentioned in the Great Hall of Faith. Interestingly enough, one that's named in the Great Hall of Faith is Samson. Uh, I want to talk about my brother Samson just a moment. Uh, Samson is a very interesting character. Many of you have heard of Samson. What have you heard? Uh, you have heard that Samson is a big, strong man. You've heard that he gathers strength from his hair. But that's not all of who Samson is. Uh, Samson is a character. Uh, so Samson, uh, he is the judge that more attention is given to him than any other judge. So he takes up a large portion of the narrative. He takes up four chapters. In the first chapter, you see a birth narrative of Samson. Samson is a Danite. He comes from the tribe of Dan. His father is named. His father's name is Manoah. And his mother is not named. Although the angel of the Lord appears to his mother, telling her of what this son is going to be. She is barren, unable to have children. And so this angel comes to her, tells her to refrain from strong drink. Don't cut the boy's hair. He is to be a Nazarite from his mother's womb. And this miraculous a series of events takes place. Uh, she goes back and tells Manoah. Manoah believes her, wants to hear it for himself. Uh, and so they call out to God. Ultimately, the angel comes back to her as she is out in the field. And she goes, gets him. He comes out and speaks to the angel. All of this is going on. They ultimately end up at uh, making a sacrifice. And through the fire of the sacrifice, the angel goes up. Manoah, Samson's father, falls to the ground thinking he's seen something so miraculous he's going to die but Samson's mother unnamed basically says if he was going to tell us all these things and all these wonderful things were going to happen to him why do you think we're going to die uh, she talked some sense into him that was good uh, chapter 14 speaks of Mar uh, Samson marrying a Philistine woman not an Israelite woman a lot going on with my brother Samson, okay? Uh, just imagine, you have been uh, barren for a long time, you're unable to have children, and God finally gives you a child. You name him Samson. The angel never told him to name him Samson, but Samson means sunshine. Imagine that this little boy was the light of their life. And they loved him so much, they probably spoiled him to death. And so now Samson says, I want to marry 
a Philistine woman. They go down to Timnah. He sees a woman that is pleasing to his eye. He says back to his parents, go get her for me to be a wife. And you wonder, they basically said, you don't want to marry a little Jewish girl? Uh, but no, uh, he wanted to marry a Philistine woman. And of course, God was going to use this to bring about deliverance from the hands of the Philistines. Uh, on their way to back to Timnah, uh, Samson comes upon the lion in the vineyard, tears it apart. Oh, Samson, um, what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is Samson is supposed to actually not be touching dead things, right? Not causing death. He's supposed to be a Nazarite. So he does this thing, and on the way back, they come back again through Timnath, through that vineyard, which is grapes, wine. He's not supposed to drink strong drink, right? Um, and then he finds honey in the carcass of this dead lion. And he reaches in, takes honey out, eats some of it itself, and gives it to his parents. So, goodness, okay. This guy, Samson. Uh, Samson poses a whittle, riddle to the wedding party. Um, when you read that section of scripture, you shake your head because uh, basically his bride had to line up a groomsman for him because she had all these bridesmaids and he didn't have anybody there with him. I don't think Samson was a well-liked individual. Um, that illustrated also that later on, the Israelite people are willing to hand him over to the Philistines because uh, all these Philistine encampment has come up and the people of Israel, they don't want any trouble with the, the Philistines. So they're willing to hand Samson over to him, to them. Um, but, he poses this riddle. They guess the riddle after his wife, Samson's wife, comes to him, begs him, bothers him, and ultimately he just tells her. And then they get it right because they go to her because they put pressure on her. And he looks at them and says, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have guessed my riddle. So Samson really doesn't compliment his bride well, does he? Uh, also in chapter 15, you see uh, Samson uh, putting together, I think probably, you know, everybody talks about Samson slaying a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey, but rarely do we talk about uh, 300 foxes uh, in sets of two having their uh, tails tied together and being set on fire and let off into uh, the Philistines' grain and vineyards to burn them up. It was kind of economic terrorism that Samson was portraying upon the Philistines. And then he's handed over to the Philistines by his own people, the Israelites. Uh, and then Samson, of course, does that uh, great, wonderful, powerful thing with the jawbone of a donkey. Not a dried, old, dead jawbone, but one probably that still had marrow and sinews and flesh still on it because he used it to kill uh, a thousand Philistines uh, at a place called Lehi. And Lehi is jawbone. So up on Jawbone Ridge, uh, <laughs> Samson slayed a thousand Philistines. Okay. Chapter 16, Samson and the a Gaza prostitute. I mean, this is kind of the stuff. Listen, the Old Testament is R-rated. Uh, sometimes it's R-rated, sometimes PG-13. But usually what we try to do is we sanitize things to tell children in Sunday school. But then, as adults, we just stick with a sanitized version. Now, if you read the Bible for what it is, it's not sanitized. It's talking about real life, real situations. And Samson went down to Gaza. He laid with a prostitute. He didn't wait till morning. It was, it was wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And he was done. They waited on him uh, to kill him. And, and notice they were willing to wait till morning. 
but he left in the middle of the night. His job was done. This was kind of guy Samson was. Uh, Samson, of course, and the deceiver Delilah. We always go to Delilah, and she deceived Samson. Literally, it was two peas in a pod. Uh, someone, uh, you had to ask yourself the question, who's, who's worse in this situation? Is it Samson or Delilah? Uh, Samson gets sheared and he is impotent, meaning that she called for the barbers. They cut off his hair and when he went to battle, he was powerless. He thought his power was in his hair, but really it was the power of God that left him. Uh, Samson avenges his own two eyes. Notice when you read that section, um, it's not that Samson is a holy warrior looking to do uh, to do the will of God. No, he had his two eyes plucked out, and so to avenge his own two eyes, he kills more Philistines in his death than in his life. And the question is often asked, was that sacrifice or suicide? I won't tell you, you be the judge. So Joshua and judges, you have uh, Joshua recording the uh, tribes being unified, the conquest of Canaan. You have Joshua uh, judges telling you the record of the Israelite tribes, settlement of Canaan. You have these books narrate both the solidarity and the estrangement of Israel's 12 tribes. This meta narrative, an overarching narrative, prepares the reader for the uh, factus monarchy that is Saul and David, the kingdoms, uh, northern Israel, Ephraim, and southern Judah. These developments are already discerned in the blessing of Judah and Joseph, Ephraim, by the father Jacob over the other brothers and by the long entrance of Caleb, Judah, and Joshua, Ephraim, into the land. So there's the book of Judges. All right, one last book for this section, and that is the book of Ruth, which I think is the best book possibly in the Old Testament. I love the book of Ruth. And I entitled this, Love in a Dangerous Time. Because these events take place during the time of the judges. So it is a dangerous time in Israel. Everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes. Um, everybody is following after their own selfish ways. And there is something beautiful that takes place. Well, the content of the book, Naomi and Ruth uh, find death and famine in Moab after their husbands die. Remember, uh, Elimelech with his family, Naomi, and his two sons, they decide to go from Bethlehem, which literally means house of bread, because there's a famine in the land. So there's no bread in the house of bread. They go over to Moab. On the other side of Jordan, a foreign country, and uh, Elimelech dies. Well, Naomi's okay because she still has two sons. Her two sons marry two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, but the sons die. And so Naomi has no one to take care of her. She's a foreign woman in a foreign land, so she's going to decide to go back home. So Naomi, an Israelite, decides to head back home. And tells uh, her two Moabitess daughters-in-law to stay in Moab. Uh, and then this is where you get that text that is used often at weddings. It, it, it surprises me that this is used in weddings because the context doesn't allow for it actually to be used in a wedding. Okay, If you use it in your wedding, that's okay. Uh, no points deducted, right? Uh, but this is Ruth talking to Naomi, and she is telling her, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. 
Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May God, oh, may the Lord deal with me. And be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. This is Ruth telling that to Naomi. And kind of the response Naomi gives her is, all right. I guess I guess I can't talk you out of it. You're coming back with me to Bethlehem. And so although all the circumstances pointed to a sad story, a divine irony prevail, prevails for Ruth and Naomi. Uh, Ruth attempts to find a kinsman of her husband to help her bear her bury her dead bear her dead husband and an heir an heir and reclaim his patronage okay so what happens in the book of ruth is uh, they go back to bethlehem uh, they being naomi and ruth ruth goes out to take care of her mother-in-law she goes as they did as the poor people did she gleans from the outside grain, and she is noticed by Boaz. Boaz asks who this woman is, and it just so happens she uh, she comes into this uh, field of Boaz, who is the kinsman redeemer that she is looking for. Uh, this is God's providence at work. She happens to work in the book in the field, uh, and they develop what seems like a uplifting romance. Uh, so there's a big difference between ages. Uh, he's probably a much older man, still a bachelor. So why still a bachelor? Well, we talked about Rahab earlier, right? Uh, Rahab is actually Boaz's mama. And think of the context in the time. Who would marry their little Jewish daughter off to a, a boy whose mother was a Canaanite prostitute? Probably very few people. In this case, Apparently none. But Ruth comes as a foreign woman. And so you wonder, Boaz is thinking, well, I know my, how my, my mother was treated. And Ruth is going to be treated the same way. And he had compassion on her, looking at her as a daughter. But she fell in love with him, and I think he loved her too. Uh, but this is how it came about. God working to bring a bride to Boaz and a husband to Ruth and ultimately a line to redeem. So Boaz takes Ruth to be his wife and, and provides her an heir for Elimelech, right? So Elimelech's line is still connected. Uh, the story of Ruth is focused on God's hidden and continuous providence. Uh, Ruth and Boaz are representatives of the biblical models of loyalty, hesed, kindness, generosity. And, and this little graphic right here comes from uh, the Bible Project. I may at some point uh, put one of the um, one of the videos up from the Bible Project. But if you want to look. At, at those, all you got to do, turn it, uh, uh, type into YouTube, the Bible Project, and they have great graphics explaining uh, in, in visual and audio detail uh, a lot of Old Testament uh, narrative and other portions. Uh, so authors, some scholars date Ruth in the time of David because she is listed in David's genealogy. So it could be, you know, it could be that someone like Samuel 
wrote David. It could be uh, wrote Ruth. It could be that David commissioned someone to write the book. Uh, because at the end of the book, what is spoken of is the fact that Naomi and Ruth, they, uh, excuse me, Boaz and Ruth have Obed. Obed is kind of given to Naomi as a son, but Obed begots Jesse, and Jesse begots David, the great king. So it is called a pro-Davidic polemic. So that has something to do with the authorship of it. Um, Others suggest that the book is a polemic against Ezra and Nehemiah and the opposition to marriage outside the nation of Israel. Remember in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, and we'll get there, uh, there is uh, such a push of nationalism that they are instructed, well so, because a lot of the downfall, a lot of the problems, i.e. Solomon, happened because of the marriage of the king to foreign women. So some suggest that it's written during that time as an argument against that uh, edict or those regulations. However, their concern was pagan foreign women. Ruth had renounced her pagan roots and adopted the uh, Israelite God as her own. So when you look at the literary structure, you have the introduction, uh, you have the Exodus in Act 2, you have or Act 1, you have Act 2 of Bethlehem, you have Act 3, Boaz introduced, you have the plan of Act 4, you have the 5 as the public pronouncement. Remember, Boaz goes to the water gate and uh, that uh, marriage is sealed. And then uh, the postlude there in chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. Uh, it is a novella. It's a love story similar to that of Esther and Jonah. Uh, although you would not look at Jonah as a love story, but it is a novella. Um, literary figures, names are representative of the plot developed. Uh, you have friend, which is Ruth's name. Ruth's name means friend, Orpah, uh, back of the neck, basically that she turns the back. Um, and then Naomi, you have Naomi, which means delight or pleasant. Uh, then you have Mara, a bitter, a bitterness, Elimelech, uh, my God is king. Uh, Malon, sickly, and uh, Chilion, frail, and then the quickness of Boaz. So the sickly boys die, right? The frail boys die. Uh, Ruth uh, was read during the Feast of the Weeks, uh, the Feast of Pentecost, and in Hebrew canon, Ruth coming after Proverbs. That's why when you uh, look at look for it in your textbook. It's written along the line of uh, Hebrew allotment, and so you had to go find Ruth. Uh, but uh, coming after Proverbs links her with the ideal woman of Proverbs 31. Here are the sources I used to put together this presentation, and please email me any questions and I will respond. Thank you for listening today.